Well, good morning. Thank you, everyone, for coming uh, this morning. If you know, my name is Matt Klein, and uh, I'm a senator from District 53, and I'm also the new uh, chair of the Commerce and Consumer Protection Committee here in the Senate. Uh, we're excited this week to be invigorating the work of consumer protection in the state of Minnesota. We feel like there is a backlog of things that Minnesotans have been clamoring for uh, that we are going to address uh, urgently. Uh, this week in the Commerce and Consumer Protection Committee, we will be hearing bills to address catalytic converter theft uh, and also to cut down on nuisance robocalls. Uh, and lastly, to address drug price gouging uh, in the state of Minnesota and protect people from uh, rapacious behaviors by pharmaceuticals. Uh, in addition, in the Judiciary Committee, I'll be presenting a bill uh, to protect individuals' data privacy if they participate in home genetic testing, such as 23andMe and so forth, and give them power over how that uh, data is distributed. Uh, so I'm excited to get that going. I think every single Minnesotan has been affected by these issues. You've either spent too much for your kids' epinephrine pen, uh, or you've uh, had your catalytic converter stolen, and virtually everyone has had a robocall uh, that they didn't expect or want. Um, so that's the agenda that we're going to move forward with quickly, and it'll only be the start of our good work uh, in the Committee on Consumer Protection. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to the chief author of the drug price gouging uh, bill, which is Senator Kelly Morrison, Senator Dr. Kelly Morrison. Thank you, Chair Klein, Dr. Chair Klein. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, I'm State Senator Kelly Morris, and I represent District 45, which is in the western suburbs of Minneapolis. And I'm here to talk about Senate File 168, which is a bill designed to address the high cost of prescription drugs. When I'm not a legislator, I'm a physician, so I know firsthand how difficult it is for patients to afford the medicine they need to survive and thrive. SF-168 would create a prescription drug affordability board and would work to stop prescription drug price gouging. The costs of prescription drugs continue to skyrocket in the United States, contributing to increased insurance premiums, strained state budgets, and growing numbers of people who are simply unable to afford the prescriptions they need. Everyone deserves access to affordable medicine without exception. No one with a chronic condition, cancer, or other health issue should lose their life or health because a drug was priced too high. And if you think about it, the high cost of prescription drugs affects all of us. We all pay the cost through, health, through our health insurance premiums, at the pharmacy, and through the toll on our public health when people can't afford the medicine they need. Lowering drug costs is also critical to health equity. The toll of inequities in housing, air quality, incarceration, health care, and more contribute to higher rates of chronic disease among indigenous and people of color in Minnesota, creating an equitable impact on the high cost of medicine and care. Establishing a prescription drug affordability board and stopping price gouging of prescription drugs benefits patients, providers, and both public and private insurers, driving down the cost of health care for all of us. In fact, establishing a pres prescription drug affordability board and stopping price gouging of prescription drugs were key policy recommendations by the Bipartisan Attorney General's Task Force on Lowering Pharmaceutical Drug Costs. And six states have already passed prescription drug affordability boards and are beginning to set upper price payment limits on certain high cost drugs. Minnesota will benefit from their experience in establishing their boards. New Jersey, New Mexico, Virginia, and Michigan are also on the verge of passing or introducing prescription drug affordability boards. There is a growing recognition across the country that the current system is not working. The pharmaceutical supply chain is complex and convoluted. It's working for its many stakeholders, but it's not working for patients. Establishing a prescription drug affordability board and stopping price gouging are steps we can take to help people afford their lives because drugs don't work if people can't afford them. Thank you for your time. I need to leave to testify in committee, so if there are follow-up questions, please contact my office. Thank you so much. Can we ask you just a couple while you're here? As I'm walking out the door, I'm literally <laughs> supposed to be out. <laughs> okay. 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 My LA Reina here, and she And I'll turn it over now to Senator John Marty to talk about catalytic converter. And thank you. And I want to say I appreciate the focus on consumer protection of the Commerce and Consumer Protection Committee. Um, as Senator Klein mentioned, there are a lot of backlog of bills to address that are long overdue. 
And I will point out that the Catawit Converter Bill, Senate File 5, is one of them. We've been pushing this for three years now. Um, and I keep hearing from people just last week, I heard from another couple who said that their undercar own parking garage had been broken into. And in three minutes, because it's all, they got video of it, um, three minutes they got at least two converters off of cars, which can be a $3,000 expense for somebody, a huge hassle. And there are solutions to this. Been working on this bill for three years, as I said, I have with me here today, and I'll introduce him in just a second, Special Agent Joe Baki from Department of Commerce, who works in the state's auto theft prevention efforts. And we have a legislation that the international auto theft investigators say could make a real difference in catalytic converter theft. And um, after three years of being denied a hearing, I'm glad that Senator Klein is expediting this. We hope to move the bill out of committee this afternoon, and it's actually scheduled if it passes today into the Judiciary Committee tomorrow, because this is the kind of crime, it's, it's a property crime, but it's something that we've had people who, you know, it's, it costs them thousands of dollars, huge heartache and everything else, and we think it is preventable. Minnesota, I think, is the third largest, third biggest state in terms of catalytic converter theft. We have a simple solution that can do it. Um, one minute gist of it is that we would require, make it a crime to possess a used catalytic converter that's not attached to a car unless it's got the vehicle identification number written on it. Have been proposed as what we have all new cars do. That's a great idea, but that would take 20 years for it to cover every car. We're simply saying when you take it off the car, you have to mark it. Whether that's you doing work on your car, a muffler shop, which don't do that many of them, or auto dismantler, they can mark the catalytic converter um, as they do every other valuable part they strip off a car. And then for the thieves, the trouble is they mark a, they don't put it on, they've got the crime of theft basically. Um, if, under this bill. This bill has about six different provisions that we think will make a huge dent in the problem, and I think it's long overdue, and so I'm very appreciative of getting an early hearing on this and moving it forward. With that, I'd like to introduce Joe Baki from Department of Commerce, who's been very instrumental in explaining how we have to address the catalytic converter theft. Good morning. My name is Joseph Baki. I'm a special agent with the Commerce Fraud Bureau. And for the last three years, I've been assigned to manage the state's auto theft prevention program. Um, much to my chagrin, I, I quickly learned that catalytic converter theft was skyrocketing in Minnesota. And as a result of that, I had people calling me from around the nation and around the world looking for advice on what to do about the problem. Uh, in addition to my role at the state, I'm, I'm also chairing a, a subcommittee on catalytic converter theft. So we came up with some recommendations on how to best address this problem. Uh, and, and Senator Marty's bill uh, looked at those recommendations, looked at what Minnesota was already doing that was well, and goes to um, blend together those recommendations in, with existing law and some expansions in ways that we think will make it a lot easier for law enforcement to investigate these crimes, for prosecutors to prosecute these crimes, and then ultimately uh, make it more difficult for criminals to sell um, the catalytic converters because uh, a, a stolen catalytic converter isn't valuable unless you have a, a method to get it back into the legitimate stream of commerce. Um, this is a crime that is affecting um, you know, people across the United States, people across the world, but we're pati hit particularly hard in Minnesota uh, when you consider the, the insurance industries rank us um, about third in the nation behind uh, California and Texas, um, and they have a whole lot more cars than people in, in California and Texas. Um, so this marking requirement uh, will make it a lot easier for law enforcement to deal with those people that they're stopping uh, at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, rolling around with a half a dozen catalytic converters that they don't have any explanation for how they ended up in the back of their car. Uh, it also has some enhanced penalties that, that mirror our state's theft law um, to make possession of a larger quantity of catalytic converters a higher level felony. And we hope that that will serve as a sufficient deterrent um, for the black market uh, buyers that are out there um, and also for the um, legitimate scrap metal dealers who um, maybe aren't quite following the law and, and eager to purchase uh, catalytic converters under circumstances that uh, common sense would say they should know something's up. I can answer any questions that, that you might have. Otherwise, I'll be testifying this afternoon as well. Do you have any idea why we rank so highly? I mean, our population next to Texas and California is 
not even remotely the same. So I'm just curious, do other states have stricter penalties or? Probably one of the number one questions I get, and I spoke to my colleagues around the nation, and I, I don't have an answer for that um, other than we, um, I, I also do some investigative work on this issue, and I can't get into all the deal details, but we, we've had um, you know, a large network of organized crime buying catalytic converters in Minnesota. Uh, you've probably seen some search warrants a few months ago related to some of those things. Um, so that may have caused the demand to get um, higher, but why it's become so incredibly high, I don't know. Chair Klein, is it your intention to have all these items move independently, or are you thinking some mega consumer protection package? I know that the robocall legislation is a, has a Republican sponsor. I mean, are you envisioning some bipartisan proposal here? You know, I do hope that these uh, initiatives get bipartisan support. We'll see how it plays out in my committee this afternoon. There's certainly no reason for any legislator from either party to oppose catalytic converter legislation uh, or robocall legislation. Uh, and uh, as far as moving them independently versus as a package, I guess I would still be open to ideas on that. Senator Marty, um, what was the explanation to you as to why you didn't get a hearing on this bill? Was it because you had a DFL after your name or because there was some opposition to the substance of the bill? Good question. The only answer I got in three years of trying was silence. I requested hearings, requested hearings repeatedly, requested hearings from the second committee the bill would go to, requested hearings. We tried the floor amendments a couple of times. I tried to pull it out of committee, tried that every time. Nope, this should be dealt with in committee. Well, why can't we have a hearing? Silence. So I don't know the reasons for it. I'm actually hoping this is a strong bipartisan vote. I hope it's, I wouldn't mind it being a unanimous vote. I think it should be, and why it wasn't heard in the last three years, it's frustrating, but I didn't know. And then, Peter, can I ask you a question? Sure. First, can you spell your last name for me? Uh, it's B as in boy, O C H E. O C H E. Yes. Okay, and you say Baki. Correct. Okay. Um, I mean, you pull some guy over, and he's got eight catalytic converters in the trunk in the back seat, and you can't do, not you personally, but a policeman, policewoman, can't do anything? That doesn't look suspicious? Certainly looks suspicious, but the, um, the challenge that that people have, and I think John Choi will be testifying to address this. Um, I was a prosecutor in a former life as well. Is it, it, under our existing law, um, the prosecutor, you know, trying would have to prosecute it as possession of stolen property. And then when the question asked, gets asked, you know, well, if it's stolen property, who does it belong to? Um, the problem that we have is there are so many of these getting stolen on a daily and weekly basis that trying you know, for the officers to take the catalytic converters and match them up with where they belong um, has become an impossible task. And, and I first kind of naively said to officers, well, just you know, look for the report and, and match it up with, with where it was stolen from. Um, and they were like, uh, it ain't that easy, Joe. And we've also learned that the very large majority of these cases are not being reported to law enforcement agencies. So they don't, they don't have anything to go on. This bill would change that, how? That possession without a number is evidence of? So the way the bill would work is if you have a, a detached used catalytic converter, there's a few nuances in, in the language, but essentially a, a detached new catal or used catalytic converter, um, I don't know anybody that does, but if you removed it in your garage to do your own repair, you need to pull out a Sharpie, write the VIN number, and then I think it's the date of removal on the catalytic converter. What that would do is if you're caught in possession of one that does not have that marking or an equivalent marking on it, um, and you have one, it's a misdemeanor. If you have two, it's a gross misdemeanor. Three or more is a felony. Uh, and, and that is what allows us to then, you know, the mere possession of an unmarked catalytic converter um, is a crime. And it makes it much more simpler to show that aspect of intent. Um, and also, it changes the value idea because prosecutors have struggled with, well, how much is this worth? And you know, the average amount is around $2,600 for a, per claim. But if you're talking like a Prius, um, the normal repair cost on that is around $3,300. So. In the absence of having a, one of the bill authors here, could you speak to the robocall bill? I, I know that Minnesota has had robocall uh, prohibition or discouragement language for quite some time. What does this bill do and how is it going to 
keep it from uh, annoying people. Yeah, uh, thank you, Brian. And it's a short bill, and, it, and essentially I think it tightens that language, but it also empowers the Attorney General to sort of uh, pursue violations, which I think has been maybe the bigger part of the problem with robocalls is that we have some existing statutes, but they are loosely or not at all enforced. And how does that work with the federal... Uh, Communications Commission's efforts to do the same things. I mean, these probably are not originating in the state of Minnesota. The AG presumably has some grab on it once they come into the state, but they're from Kazakhstan. So, what 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 grab does the AG have to get? These? You know, that's a good question, and that's something I would have to defer to his office, I guess, for a follow up question on that to give you a real uh, the best answer on that. So. Senator Marty, is there anything in your catalytic converter bill that, that deals with the scrap metal part, or is it simply focused on the catalytic converter part? We're, the catalytic converters, I mean, the, the precious metals, the catalysts that convert the gases to less toxic ones, um, I think it's rhodium has hit $26,000 an ounce or so, like 12 times the price of gold. There's trace amounts of them in there, but at that kind of price, is it's hugely valuable. So this is different than, well, pawn shops and scrap dealers. If we've already tightened up laws because of copper pipe theft and things like that, we're trying to do it here in a way that you have this piece of rusted exhaust piping under your car and um, that happens to be worth hundreds and hundreds of dollars. And um, we're trying to say that what can we do to make it happen? Again, there have been proposals here and nationally to require new cars to be labeled that way, but again, it'd be 20 years before we get all the cars on the road labeled. And so we're just simply saying, why don't we cut to the chase and say, you don't need your catalytic converter mark, but if you take it off, you do. And it's easy for you to mark it on, it's easy for a muffler shop to mark it on, it's easy for an auto scrapper to mark it on, it's difficult for a thief to. They can get the VIN number from your windshield, but if, if I find a thief with your catalytic converter and the number's on it, um, we call you, did you give them your converter? No, they stole it. Well, we got them for theft there. If they don't mark it on there, um, then we got the crime of possessing, because it's illegal to possess them. And um, frankly, if they put a false number on that, it's fairly easy for law enforcement to figure out too, because most of the cars in the world with most of the VIN numbers are not Minnesota cars. And um, so it, it helps a lot, because if they're putting a false number down, that would be a violation as well. One other process question here. Uh, we've seen other House Senate consensus items shake loose prior to the big budget and policy bills going forward. Are these items on that list of things that could or will happen in the next few weeks before you guys get so deep into the budget that everything will get lumped in? I'll speak to that briefly. Yeah, this, is, this should be a fairly small fiscal note. Um, we're depending on how we work out with it would be Department of Public Safety that would be running it uh, What we choose to do would be a relatively small fiscal note, but this is one I think um, We're trying to there are a number of bills as you say are going to be traveling on their own And I think a lot of these are some of them are incidental fiscal costs, but um, this one it's Fiscal note was like 300,000 a year, and I don't know that it has to be that high, but we're going to work that out point is, I hope we can pass this bill on its own. I don't want to wait till the end of session and so on because we'd like it to move as quickly as we can. And as far as the, uh, the Morrison bill, the Drug Price Affordability Board, uh, and I'll coordinate with Finance Chair Marty on this as well, uh, I would be grateful to move that independently, but I would also, I've coordinated with uh, our Representative Stevenson, the Commerce Chair in the House, and he intends to prioritize that in his budget, and I intend to do the same if it doesn't move independently. So. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Senator Marty, before you go, could 